What is 5G and what is something that probably everybody thinks they know, but they have wrong? Probably one of the biggest innovations since the invention of the internet, really the explosion of the industrial internet. The problem with TikTok is really about what you can do with people's data. Who owns your data? It's actually China. It's censorship. It's control of your population. We don't even have a telecommunications manufacturer left in this country. So we're not leading anything. Can we adapt to the world that we created that has basically been weaponized against us? The reality is we were asleep at the wheel. We're drinking Kool-Aid. So welcome to another episode of Generally Speaking. Today we have John Trobaugh, co-CEO of Q Networks and a Silicon Valley veteran. We're going to ask him about technology, 5G, and a whole bunch of other things. So John, thanks for joining, Generally Speaking. Nice, nice to see you again, Rob. So, uh, and, and this time it works. So uh, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You were talking before when we tried this the first time a little bit about your uh, your three prong career. So, yeah, as I was saying earlier, I've I've had uh, probably three distinct careers. I think the the first part of my career was in the uh, more traditional telecom operator space back before we invented uh, digital wireless or the mobile internet. And then the the next phase of my career, I spent uh, about twenty plus years in Silicon Valley as a software CEO and uh, got to know the valley and got to see the, the rise of the uh, the dot-com era and the downturn and actually even lived through the uh, the mortgage meltdown. So uh, got that roller coaster. And then most recently, I've spent my time working at the intersection of uh, government and technology with the private sector. And how do we get private technologists uh, more engaged with government to help push forward some of these uh, uh, technology challenges uh, that we have? So, so and that's where I met you in, uh, when I was in the Pentagon and you were working in the White House and you were a prestigious uh, presidential innovation fellow. So <laughs> can, you, uh, can you tell us what a presidential innovation fellow is and how you ended up, um, you know, going from, I, I don't know, you're, you're on your couch to, uh, to, the, to the White House? That's a good yeah, story. As a, an Obama baby, as I'm sometimes uh, referred to as well, which, uh, but I'm one of the few presidential fellows who worked uh, across both administrations, so I do have that distinction. But, but yeah, during my, uh, I was literally sitting on the couch in Silicon Valley and had just uh, got done on a project with Boeing, and we exited a company and was watching the news, and I see President signs the executive order creating presidential innovation fellows, and I was sitting there drinking a scotch and had my iPad next to me. I said, well, that sounds kind of cool. And I just sent a cold call email to the White House. (laughs) Then they called me back. And then when they called me back, at first I thought it was a joke and I didn't call them back. (laughs) And then the second second time they called, they said, well, maybe it really is the White House. So I answered. And uh, that's how I wound up, uh, you know, spending a a couple of years in Washington, D.C., going back and forth to D.C. and Silicon Valley and and getting plugged into uh, government and trying to bring commercial technologists uh, into Department of Defense in particular. So... So what what was your the I think the biggest uh, shock that you had coming into government and what was it I mean what how is it different than you know working in the private sector? <laughs> uh, well, I could state the obvious, you know the uh, the, the paperwork and uh, you know the the slowness in decision making, but uh, I, I think probably the real shock for me was. Uh, was the hours that people really work more normalized, so, you know, eight to five lives, if you will, as opposed to uh, maybe what I was more accustomed to, which is the uh, hair on fire, you know, got to beat the, the next closest tech company who's breathing down your neck, uh, you know, because your venture capitalists are, are, are sitting on top of you, you know, type of uh, environment of the Valley. So, so they're very, very different environments, both of them with their, their pros and cons, though. So, so, so your goal uh, or your task was to bring some Silicon Valley uh, expertise to government. How how did that go? And uh, and was it easy to recruit people to come and do that? Well, how did it go? What I found is that uh, you could come up with some really cool ideas. And you know, we worked on a project called Cloud.gov and really trying to look at how do you how do you bridge uh, small business uh, companies into government so that government could actually purchase their products and services. And so we built a a cloud.gov portal and you could go out and buy all these different uh, apps and services that the commercial world has to offer. 
But then when we got to uh, the next phase, which is, okay, now we got to go market it and tell everybody inside of government that we built this project, then it came down. So, well, you actually can't spend any money to do that. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was like a wait, wait. learning experience. Wait, what? <laughs> you can't spend money? No, we couldn't spend We could not spend marketing dollars to go out and promote and make government aware that we had gone and built this portal that they had asked us to, to, to bridge small business into government and to allow government to, to more rapidly acquire, you know, uh, or procure, you know, small business products and, and services. And so that was a learning experience. And then after that, uh, and then I focused, you know, obviously, you know, you and I, where we cross paths, trying to figure out with the National Security Council is, you know, how does it designates? How do we how do we bring private industry technologists uh, into the defense side? And I think uh, we've done a real good job of of deploying presidential innovation fellows across the federal government. You know, the story is, you know, presidential fellows started because of the uh, the healthcare website that had gone down and, and how the White House had reached out to Silicon Valley to help and it just kind of snowballed from there. But uh, we hadn't yet crossed the the uh, uh, river, if you will, and said, OK, let's go work with the Pentagon and let's go see if we can figure out how to, to bring technologists into the Pentagon to also help uh, DOD with technology challenges and, and bringing, you know, COTS products or commercial services into DOD. So. And that's where you and I met. And, um, and that is where um, consequently the, um, the infamous DIUX paper comes from that, uh, that uh, bringing Silicon Valley into the defense department. So can you, do you remember the story? Can you tell the story of how all that came together? And it, and it ultimately led to, uh, the current leadership in DIU. Yeah, well, you know, we were, uh, I think, you know, you and I were looking at uh, trying to figure out how to do something with, uh, with the new uh, office that you were standing up in China, or looking at uh, China inside of DOD. And, you know, there was an opportunity to uh, educate people on who the largest investor in Silicon Valley is. And most people, you know, believe historically, uh, they're always surprised to think, well, it's Intel, right, uh, which historically has been true, but it's actually, you know, uh, China. It's the yeah, largest spoiler venture alert, capitalist. The Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> the Chinese Communist Party has access to U.S. technology and know-how in Silicon Valley faster than, you know, our own, uh, our own government does. And so, yeah, so we, uh, you know, look to collaborate on that paper. And at the same time, uh, Mike Brown from uh, Semantic was, you know, moving on from from his position and uh he's another one that i had uh just picked up the phone and reached out to and said hey you want to want to get back and something kind of interesting over here and we uh we mixed a good class of kool-aid and uh, you and i both did and we were able to pull mike in and and get him to write that paper and and work on it with some colleagues and and really run around and start educating the hill on you know what a uh, uh, who is the real largest investor in Silicon Valley, and so and then today he's since gone on to turn that into uh, he 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 loves GovTech so much that he he decided to stay in the uh, and he's running DOD's I know DOD's version of venture capital right and so yeah. he's still uh, uh, he's still in it today and I guess we can say that's our claim to fame is that we're both out but you know we talked him and he's still day. in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think the, the 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 big so what of that that people don't realize is, you know, from that small beginnings, from you picking up the phone and, you know, calling the White House to um, where we're at today, that was the beginning. That DIUX report that Mike wrote, you know, that we, we collectively, you and I worked together to bring Mike into government, that DIUX report is the genesis essentially of what we would get eventually get in government called the section 301 report the section 301 investigation that the u.s trade representative did that all tariffs on china are basic that basically come from so that started it started with that diux report um that that we worked on so you know you know, part of the 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 goal of that was to show that you know this progression of from a very humble you know, start from your picking up the phone and and uh, and calling the White House and and coming on board. And we met, and I'm trying to figure out China, and you have the experience and the connections to to allow that to happen. Really, eventually led to 
you know, probably one of the most consequential reversals in trade policy in U.S. history. And that that that's just one of the many things that uh, that, you know, I think we've been around. But probably the most important thing that I see today and that, that you're currently working on uh, as co-CEO of Q Networks is the is the 5G network. So what is 5G? And, you know, what in your mind is something that 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 probably everybody thinks they know, but they have wrong? Yeah, what is 5G? I mean, gosh, you uh, don't 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 you see it when you turn on your phone? It says 5G <laughs> <laughs> or you watch the TV commercials yeah. coming through a town near you. Right. There's so much noise out there in, in you know, hand waving and misrepresentation on on 5G and where it is. But but ultimately, you know, uh, all that being aside from a pure technology perspective, I look at 5G as being probably one of the biggest uh, innovations since the the invention of the internet. And I say that just simplistically because it's where, you know, wireline connectivity and wireless tech connectivity start to, to collide and we start to have ubiquity between, you know, speeds and, and, and access and is one, you know, uh, major aspect of 5G. But it's also, you know, uh, will enable a, a new generation of services as well. I mean, really the, the explosion of the industrial industry internet. And we talk a lot today, you know, everyone, everyone wants to associate wireless with being about voice, and I can gain faster or, or video. And the reality is that's the, the real value of 5G is enabling the industrial internet. And it's really how do we, to me, it's the, it's the, it's the foundation for how it is we're going to move forward in the reindustrialization of this country is, you know, if we can roll out 5G, and we can do it, you know, in a constructive way, we can create a next generation of, of manufacturing jobs and get back to where we used to be, which would be technical thought leaders and telecommunications. And, and we've lost that uh, is the reality. And that's something Americans don't want to believe. But uh, the data all speaks the truth. And but 5G, you know, is a, is a uh, to me is a major underpinning on, on our, our future economic viability as a nation. I just don't think I think we keep thinking of it in terms of well, I'm going to watch faster movies and who gives a damn? We we gotta if we don't get back to reindustrializing the nation and using you know using this uh, the industrial internet to be the, the underpinning of that, we got bigger problems. So there's this big uh, thing going on now uh, in government <clears throat> called TikTok, and and uh, of course you and I have talked about TikTok yeah, quite a bit. It's but, banned in my house, <laughs> right? It's banned in your house, but you know I I think one of the things that people don't understand is that the problem with TikTok is really about the problem of what you can do today with people's data. So you can literally um, understand the personality, the interactions, the relationships, nearly just about everything that you want about a person using the data collected by their smartphone. But then when you build that into a smart city, you literally have everything about the person. Now, we typically don't think about the problems that causes, but as you and I have talked about, the ability to influence you to buy a pair of shoes that Amazon leverages with their um, data empire and algorithms and, and machine learning and artificial intelligence can also be used to affect your political orientation, your, your cultural, your social uh, orientation, and really can be used as we know, to undermine our, our political system. So, you know, you know, talk, talk us through kind of what the data security problems are in 5G, because I think that's where, um, you know, people have heard it's a faster smartphone, but okay, what's all the, what's going, who has access to this data that, that yeah. you know, the tech companies are creating? Yeah, you're right. And that's a, that's even a, you know, a, a bigger picture description of, you know, what 5G does, right? Is that 5G creates, uh, you know, let's call it hypothetically 10x the amount of data that we we see today, and even at a more at a more granular level. And if you believe, as as many do, and I think China's even come out and said this, right? That the data is the gold of the or, or the oil of the next generation. 
then you kind of got to scratch your head and go in the U.S. It's like, well, what the hell are we doing about it, right? We're <laughs> and so when you look at things like for me, when I look at things like TikTok, I'm like, okay, well, why don't we just put a put a uh, you know a beacon in everybody's hand and let them walk around and they can call and collect, you know, other nation states can collect as much information as they want on on individual U.S. citizens or or their surroundings as they need. And, uh, and TikTok, I think, is just the poster child for where an explosive app or service can really enable that that type of potential, you know, government state sponsored, you know, access to, to U.S. citizens, which is, you know, really unheard of because we don't as American citizens, we don't really think about the about, the, you know, data and uh, the importance you know, uh, of data. But I think specific to your question, you know, when you think about 5G, then you go, okay, well, 5G, we've always also had this point of view that, uh, that, well, networks are secure because we trust our, our, our North American, you know, wireless operators. If we don't trust them, you know, who do we trust, right? And, uh, and the reality is that historically, and you go, uh, you know, through all the Gs up through 4G, it's primarily been driven by a lot of uh, U.S. influence or even directly by the U.S., where we've always been leaders in the telecommunications industry. The last 100 years, the U.S. has led the telecommunications industry. You look at it today and you go into 5G, we don't even have a telecommunications manufacturer left in this country. So we're not leading anything. So what we're doing is buying other people's products and services and putting it into our networks and then telling U.S. citizens, trust, it's okay. Don't worry, I bought it in China, but you can trust it. So, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, and that in and of itself exposes a lot of data risk. You get into all the issues, whether it's, you know, man in the middle and how people are snooping on, snooping on you, or you get into, uh, you know, who owns your data, right? Or, you know, do you trust your data being, you know, unencrypted? Or uh, it, it raises a lot of questions. And I think there's a lot of data privacy issues that come with 5G, which we're just not even really talking about because we don't understand that it's really about data. And, it, you know, let's, let's win the battle for the oil of the next generation. In, and let's let that drive our, our economic policy decisions and then also drive what we should be doing from a technology level as we build out networks. So, so w- one of the things that uh, government has said is that uh, if we just get rid of Huawei in, in North America, then everything's fine. So, so is Huawei the only problem? Because, um, you know, what I understand is that when you bring all of these companies together, you know, I'm an Air Force guy, you're an industry guy, but when you bring Huawei and Ericsson and Samsung Sung and, and Nokia together, aren't, aren't they building basically a, a, a um, uh, what's the word I'm looking here for, a common network, a common architecture, uh, uh, at least uh, in terms of the way they look at the technology that underpins 5G? <laughs> Yeah, I think you're probably uh, alluding to a bit the uh, the standards, right? The interoperability of the, of the standards and this idea that uh, if we if we don't uh, uh, buy Huawei, then hey, everything's great, right? We're going to use Ericsson, or we're going to use uh, China, right? Or China, I mean Nokia, who's you know uh, has a lot of uh, you know business in 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 subsidiaries in China as well. But the real issue is that, you know, then you go look at it and say, okay, well, who does who designed the global standard, right? As remember, as I said, is that the U.S. designed in, or in the West, we, we really influenced the first four generations. We sure as hell didn't finish, influence the fifth. I mean, you go look at the, the number of patents and who owns the most patents in 5G. It's no one in the U.S. You got Qualcomm up there. Maybe you got Intel up there, but who else, Right. I mean, 5G, the standard, the global standard is, is, is driven by a lot of Chinese companies. And, you know, that's, uh, they've been very aggressive in, you know, their global standards participation with uh, uh, an eye towards how they believe the network should be designed and built out. And uh, I think from a, from a U.S. perspective, had we been uh, a lot more active and, you know, I'm sure I could walk, you know, it'd be blasphemy if I were talking to a carrier, but since I, since I'm the CEO of a private carrier, that's, you know, looking at this issue going, no, we got it wrong. You know, I'm going to say it, but the reality is we were asleep at the wheel. 
And, uh, you know, we're just assumed that the, the, the telecommunications infrastructure providers that we buy product from uh, were taking into consideration, you know, our democratic values uh, around privacy and other things when they're thinking about the management of data and how to securitize that in a world where data is going to completely explode and you're going to have ubiquity between the Internet and the wireless Internet. And we know still, we still, and we still this day, we keep talking 5G and it's like, well, I'm a faster Netflix, right? People, they do not understand the game that we are really playing on a global level with this, uh, this, this data, this data war, if you will. And uh, the importance of 5G is the underpinning for that and how we as a nation, we just can't lose, right? And uh, right now everyone says, ah, we're building out 5G and like, you know, if you believe the TV commercials, hell, it's coming to a city near me, right? So so you we'll you brought that up in the beginning. So what is it what is the state of play with the NEPs, the network equipment providers uh, in North America, just say for CBRS radio. So CBRS is in the <laughs> mid band because yeah. right there the AT&T's building 5G, T-Mobile, um, uh, Verizon, they're all building 5G. So you should be able to get easily get a a uh, CBRS band radio in, in, in North America in 5G, right? Yeah, no, I think you're, you're, you know, it's a duopoly. I mean, reality is that the ecosystem does what the carriers tell them to do. And though, so when you have new, new, new entrants, such as what we're doing at Q, and you're looking at how, what, how do you build out a securitized network that enables end users to control their data to manage the privacy and the use of their own data and information. I pick up the phone and I call, uh, you know, any of the different radio access network providers and, and say, hey, I want to buy uh, CBRS radios. And, you know, their, their response is, well, you know, once we give it to AT&T or Verizon, then you can come back and buy it. <laughs> and so they don't do anything. They don't build them. It's all bespoke. Right. And it's uh, based on. So if they're not ordering the radios, they're, they're, not, they're not available. Ordering them. So, they're not there. So, so, so the truth of the matter them. is they're not building 5G. I mean, that's that's that, I think that's the point yeah. that you're trying to make is that's, that they're is saying true. they are, yes. but they're but they're really not. Well, you know, um, CBS radios are not there for. for, they're, they're, for yeah, they're just not available. Not right. Available. So so when you um, when you think about Silicon Valley and. And everybody thinks of Silicon Valley uh, is synonymous with technology. So you alluded to something that I think is very important, and that is that, you know, we've lost the bubble. We've lost the lead on technology. So, you know, in reality, Silicon Valley is no longer about technology. It's more about, you know, how do you, you know, create this next unicorn based on getting to market faster with your idea. but in, in, in all reality, the technology is not that exquisite. It's basically some new way or new application or new use of existing technology that you try to rush to market. So there's not a lot of actual invention going on other than in business models. W would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I think that I think the focus is on uh, business model creativity, uh, new algorithm development for harvesting of data. And uh, you know, new creative ways to to uh, to generate usage data, but and and I think of that being more at the application uh, you know layer, if you will. But if you go down into uh, you know, you say, well, who builds the middleware? Who builds the 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 next generation infrastructure, uh, if you will? Uh, there's not, you know, uh, there's not big dollars pouring into that. It's, it's typically viewed as, uh, you know, ah, I don't want to do that. I mean, look, you, you look at the way software is even developed today, and let's just take even at the, 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 the service or the application layer, you take something like, a, you know, a GitHub and uh, the analogy I like to use, it's like, you know, knowing how to frame a house and know why studs are six, you know, 12 inches on center and, and how it is you, you frame out that wall is very different then standing up the prefab wall, you know, all ready to go and saying, well, now I know how to build a home, right? The guy, the, 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 the company that knows why, why the studs are, are 12 inches on center is a very different company than one that just slaps four walls together. And I think we've lost, and it, it gets back to almost in, in many ways to, I look at as this bleed over where we talk about the loss of manufacturing in this country. I would also argue that we are losing that, that, that same mindset has bled over 
in technology and software development as well, because we were stopped, we've stopped building the underlying pillars or the foundation that enable the services that we want to build. Right. And I think that's, uh, you know, you, you look at, look, you go look at carriers today, you go look at, you know, the return on capital, you know, that they deliver versus a, a Google or a Facebook or the others. And if you're an investment banker, it's like, well, where are you going to put your money? You're going to go invest into to infrastructure, or are you going to go keep enabling, you know, uh, new apps and services, and go develop a new algorithm? So, so, so we're we're not uh, we're not aligned there. And I think you know what's what I also remind people of, which they they forget, is that Silicon Valley was actually started by by the defense industry, and uh, you know most people in Silicon Valley don't even know that this government and the defense industry has started Silicon Valley. And right now, if you, you were to run up and down Sand Hill Road and say, hey, I got a tech startup and it's awesome and we're going to sell to the Department of Defense and government, they would uh, you probably wouldn't even get a meeting. So is the, the sad that, truth. That's frightening because I think the time that you're talking about, we were spending almost 2% of gross domestic product here in the United States on science and technology, the space race, the Cold War. We were investing, you know, billions of dollars of government money into, you know, basic science research, which we don't do anymore. You know, Apple, you know, took advantage of a lot of those investments that govern, government had made and companies like Bell Labs that had done research for the United States on behalf of the Department of Defense that basically had this technology sitting around and, and a lot of Silicon Valley was built on the back of that. And then what happened was we stopped. We just stopped investing as a country in that. And then what, we, what we've done is we've been living off the fat of that for, for decades now. And we built something amazing. But the problem is, you know, as we talk about with TikTok, this amazing thing we, we built actually is, is best applied in a system that you, allows you to control people. And, you know, I just had, uh, um, we just talked to Rand Waltzman uh, in a prior episode, and he's a master of disinformation. And he talks about how the Chinese have used crowdsourcing to do crowd control, which is something that I think we would say we are absolutely horrified by. It's, it's censorship, it's control of your population. But the Chinese Communist Party has adapted the tools and the uh, technologies and the business models of Silicon Valley, and then applied it not only to oppressing their own people, but now they're you know essentially influencing our own uh, population yeah. through applications like TikTok, through businesses like uh, Alibaba, and and certainly through the Chinese Communist Party, basically putting pressure on U.S. companies to censor their own employees for for working. Yeah. No, no, no disagreement. I mean, it's uh, uh, they, they've done, a, you know, there's a, a good job of extending that 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 control model via commercial apps and services into to other nation states. And, uh, you know, it, it, it would be like saying, you know, if the U.S. government were to, you know, collect all the data from, you know, from the fangs here in the U.S. and then use that and harvest that data for understanding all the different nations that, you know, those private U.S. companies or those public U.S. companies did business uh, in. And, and that's that goes against our, our values and our principles for democracy. And what but uh, you know, the reality is uh, not everybody else is playing playing by the same rules, and we don't recognize that. And you know, our views and of uh, you know, you mentioned we're living off the fat is one issue, but I also think that we may have our head in the sand a little bit on the fact that you know, democracy as we know it is is, is really under under threat. It, it's you know, some of some of the underlying you know, pillars of what forms our views of what democracy are, are changing very dramatically in front of us because of technology. And we haven't yet adapted at a, at a lawmaker level as to what that means. Look, I, I started this story when I was, uh, you know, uh, I won't say what company it was, a CEO of a company in the Valley, and we'd have uh, politicians would come through to, to see what we were doing. And I would have to spend a, a half day you know, explaining our technology and what we did. And we did advanced uh, big data analytics. And inevitably, I never got the congressman or, you know, the sitting elected official. You'd always get some 
20 something who at least understood how to log in to Facebook or Instagram or use some of those services. So then they could try to interpret what we were doing and then report that up to lawmakers. I think, I think even at a lawmaker level, our understanding of technology and the implications of technology or in, in how to formulate effective policy to protect our democracy and further our, our economic agendas uh, is, uh, is very limited. Yeah, and so just uh, for for the uh, audience out there, Fangs, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. It's really you know from the time the iPhone was uh, came into view in two thousand seven, over ten years, they they moved from being nowhere to being now twenty five percent of the Standard and Poor um, uh, index, and and that means they have huge outsized uh, control over the global information economy not but not only that you know they are really the targets that the chinese communist party goes after so baidu uh, is essentially google alibaba is essentially amazon and tencent is facebook and so their goal is essentially to take baidu alibaba and tencent and through dominating the 5g platform and being able to be the first to bring those apps and services and business models to market, to then use that to pole vault over the top of the thing. So you just talked about how dangerous it would be if the U.S., you know, basically used the data that the fangs collect and their and their ability to mine that data for information and and, and create influential algorithms. But that's exactly what the Chinese are doing, and the bats, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent have those same technologies, except they are controlled by an authoritarian regime that essentially wants to use that data for exactly those things. So, I mean, this we're on the precipice of, you know, a transformational time in in not only geopolitics, but only but also in preserving our republic. So we're close to the 250 years where most republics um, essentially disintegrate. So the, the, the question I think that's so important that you're alluding to is, can we adapt to the world that we created that has basically been weaponized against us? And this is, this is where I think, you know, both you and I have been focused on for, you know, the the last three years. And I think it's going to take, you know, another 10 to really determine whether or not the U S survives as a democracy, how many democracies actually can, you know, make the transition from, understanding how to protect their sovereignty and independence in the physical world, or as or as you say, the energy or the oil of the 21st century being data, you know, can we, can we, can we manage to transition and protect ourselves in the same way that we protected the United States, you know, in, the, in World War I and World War II and the Cold War, but using different tools that really have nothing to do with bombs and bullets. You know, it's, it's can we, um, deal with the fact that as Kai-Fu Lee says, and Kai-Fu Lee is a leading artificial intelligence thinker in China, you know, they intend and are on the way to becoming the Saudi Arabia of data. What does that mean for us when they can take all of that data, which means theirs and ours, and then put it in algorithms that really allow them to pull the levers behind the scenes in ways that we're not even, uh, we don't even perceive. It's happening right now in our own you know, run up to a, a 2020 campaign, something that I'm completely, um, you know, terrified by because I think that we're, we're not in position to actually defend ourselves from it. No, I don't, I don't disagree with you. It is, uh, uh, the, the 250 year Republic, you know, was an interesting comment and yeah, I sometimes wonder, are we, uh, you know, you know, Ro- Rome seems to have a, a lot of analogy, right? <laughs> Just, you know, uh, when I think of it in, in, in that way, but, but we did invent a lot of these tools and services. And if we can get back and, and this is where, to me, when we talk about, when I, you know, I mentioned reindustrialization earlier, to me, it's not just, you know, bring, it's not bringing back manufacturing the way manufacturing used to be. It's, it's also bringing back our ingenuity and our technological innovation on how manufacturing, you know, should look in the future, right? I mean, look at, look at uh, Tesla and look at Elon Musk and, you know, some of the, the, the factories out in, uh, uh, that they're, you know, factor of the future that they're 
are working on is a, is a model that you know will still creates jobs, still creates jobs, and you know high you know higher skilled jobs. But but it's a great example of where we're the two worlds are are kind of coming together. And I think that also has to happen in in Silicon Valley as well. Is that it's okay to get back to building infrastructure? I look at it as simply simplistically as you know having been in the software world when we used to build, you know, a lot of the infrastructures that you're, you're designing and thinking of the innovation and the infrastructure with an eye towards the services that you want to enable in the future. But if you're not designing and building the infrastructure for what it is you want to enable in the future, you're just sitting back waiting for someone to tell you what it is they did. And that gets back to just sitting back waiting for, you know, whether it's China or someone else to say, Hey, Tell us what the tell us about that next wave of infrastructure is going to be like, so I can start thinking about a creative business model and more algorithms. That does not push forward our the economic interest, interests of you know of the country as a whole, right, or the labor market as for the country as a whole. And I, I think technologists have far more you know influence over uh, you know the infrastructure. And you know, contribution to the reindustrialization of the country than they realize. I think we can we tend to think of it as being, you know, I'm trying to just save a you know a manufacturing plant who's a cabinet maker, you know, in Pennsylvania or something, which you know, there's a lot of great people who are losing their jobs. And but it, I think it, it it to me it bleeds over into the technology as well. And I think when when we can start to bridge the gap between uh, those two, uh, uh, you know industries or, or points of view, if you will, then then the U.S. will, will have a chance. But right now, uh, we're getting our butts handed to us and, and we just don't want to admit it because we all feel like our 401ks are doing well and stock market's up. But, you know, go peel back the stock market and say, well, if I go take out the, the fangs out of the stock market, is the market really way up the way it seems? I, I think we're just we're drinking Kool-Aid. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, we're, I, I just read a book, and, and I know I, I talked to you about it. It's called The Kill Chain, uh, written by Christian Bros. And it talks about that the fact that these tools that you were working on in Silicon Valley actually never made their way into the Department of Defense. So this ability to do mm. collaboration at the speed of light and apply that on the battlefield, you know, just never made it there. And it's still not there today. In fact, you know, we we have these stovepipe communication systems. We have these very archaic uh, ways of working and collaborating on the battlefield that don't represent, you know, modern tools that, you know, business is using today. And so what he, what 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 Christian talks about is how do we bring that into the modern battlefield to make us, you know, better and more efficient in killing. And and the reality is that we as we've been talking about, it's not about applying force on the battlefield anymore if you can basically undermine you know john trobaugh's kids and make them think that communism is better than democracy because essentially that's what the chinese communist party's goal is it's not to fight with the united states it's to slowly erode our own you know um, trust and faith in the principles and values that underpin the society that's it you know the idea that you know, war is politics by other means, or rather politics is war by other means is, is, is what the Chinese Communist Party is after. So, you know, this is, in my mind, uh, why uh, I left the military, because I saw that the battlefield had shifted. It had shifted into our communities, into our cities, and into our, our very homes, and it's something that we need to get after. And I think, you know, what you have been doing and what you have committed your life to do, I think, is incredibly valuable in that fight. So, you know, I wore, I wore a flight suit, you wore, you wear a pullover and flip-flops. You know, I would say that the, 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 the uniform of the modern warrior is a pullover and, and flip-flops. And, uh, and, you know, so I want to say, I want to thank you for your service. Um, and I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on. Generally speaking, this has been, you know, incredibly enlightening and, and I always enjoy talking to you. So thanks. Thanks, John, for coming on and, uh, and, and, We'll have you on again. Appreciate it, Rob. We'll keep up the good fight. And uh, hopefully we're both looking back 10 years from now going, whew, man, we were right. We pivoted at the right time. We made it. So we made it.